And so shall we? Um, we're so happy to have uh, Sarah Wyman here. She is the author of The Real Lolita, The Kidnapping of Sally Harner, and the novel that scandalized the world, which is out in paperback now, and we've got it in the bookstore. Um, Susan Choi, whose novel um, Trust Exercise was just announced as a long list for the National Book Award. And Morgan Jerkins, who is the, um, she is a senior editor at Zora, and she teaches at Columbia University. Uh, she is also the author of This Will Be My Undoing, Living at the Intersection of Black, Female, and Feminist in White America. And uh, we have all of their books in the bookstore, so after we do our event, I invite you to go out into the cafe uh, for a reception and signing and uh, chat with them in a less formal setting, too. But for now, let's welcome them all to the stage. Well, thank you all so much for coming. Um, first of all, this is a grand excuse for me to celebrate the publication of the paperback of my book. Um, just to avoid a little bit of confusion, just because publishing being what it is, we changed the subtitle, so it's actually um, a lost girl, an unthinkable crime, and a scandalous masterpiece. Mm -hmm. Although I do miss the old subtitle <laughs> for reasons I won't get into. But I'm so, so pleased to have Susan and Morgan joining me to talk about Lolita. I, I wanted to have this event because I've spent the last, really the last year, going around the US and Canada talking about Lolita, talking about Sally Horner's kidnapping and how it was an inspiration for Nabokov in writing and creating Lolita. But I also knew that I had so much to say about this novel and in thinking about it, revisiting it after reading it as a kid, as a child, coming back to it as, a, as an adult. And so I feel like it's also kind of a grand excuse to pose some of the questions that I got asked to smart, awesome writers and readers like yourselves. So let me first start with you, Morgan. When did you first read Lolita and what was your impression then? And then revisiting it later on, be it adulthood or whenever, and what was sort of the difference? Yeah, so I first read Lolita when I was an upperclassman in high school. I was very bored with a lot of the reading selections. And when I was taking an English AP or advanced placement course, I was allowed to pick a book out of like 20 and then write a report on it. And so I chose Lolita mainly because I liked the title. And then I looked and saw the summary and I was like, oh, OK, this is, sounds scandalous. So like, I'm going to read it. Um, <laughs> And I was just riveted from the front to the back, um, just the way that it starts. It's like, okay, this is an obsession that Humbert Humbert has. And I think I was also just surprised that someone got away with writing that, um, especially it, it went in a time where it was much, I guess, how do I say, content was much more censored back then, or just that people weren't so out in the open, or they never were supposed to be, but you know what I mean. Like, I just thought that it was, I was like, how did this even get past an editor? Why did they acquire it? How did it even get, become this successful? Mm -hmm. Well, how much, how familiar are you with Lolita's publication history subsequently? Oh, no, not that familiar. So it's interesting that you pick up on mm -hmm. that because it did take Nabokov quite a while to find a publisher. Mm -hmm. Several editors had turned him down, including at FSG, mm -hmm. at, um, maybe not Random House, but um, there were at least three or four, Doubleday, at mm -hmm. least three or four of them turned it down saying, we think that you're talented, obviously, and some of them had published Nabokov's mm -hmm. work before, but they felt that if they published it, they would get sued, mm -hmm. and that it would, because of obscenity laws being what it was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it took first publishing it as a sort of this fly-by-night thing mm -hmm. in France through Olympia Press, and then circulating back when um, the uh, then publisher of Putnam, Walter Minton, mm -hmm. got wind of it and wrote Nabokov a letter saying, um, I'm interested in this novel, are the rights up? Mm -hmm. So, it's in so I, 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 I'm interested and, and intrigued that that's yeah. kind of what brought you up. For, for you, Susan, what was sort of your first impression of reading Lolita and or 
a more recent re rereading and how the novel has changed for you? Yeah, it's funny because I, I, I have been struggling to remember my first read and I, I cannot remember the first time I read it. I know. See, that's I, an interesting answer too. Like, I, I, I feel like remember. that's a novel that you would remember. And so the fact that you don't, is that indicative of anything or? <laughs> it's really, I find it really strange. And um, I, you know, by process of elimination, because I read nothing in high school, I'm pretty sure I didn't read it in high school. Um, <laughs> and then I know that I had read it by 1995, and I'm pretty sure I'd read it twice. Yeah. I've now just exposed my age, roughly. <laughs> um, I think I read it in college, and I think I read it, I know I read it in graduate school. And my copy still has um, really enigmatic post-it notes with arrows pointing to I'm not sure what. Like I tried really hard to figure out what, what's the arrow pointing at. And you still at. have that copy. Yeah, and I couldn't, I can't discern what I was pointing to. What, what seemed like the thing. Mm -hmm. I have no idea what I was thinking. I mean, was it a question of certain stylistic things? Because that's also something I want to get into is just what your sort of response was to the way that Nabokov uses language and something that I feel like I think about a lot, which is his incredible ability to seduce the reader. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm curious what either, well, both of your thoughts are on that regard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it was surprising to me when I found out that English was not his first language because, like as I mentioned with the first page, it in the first page alone, it taught me so much about rhythm. It taught me so much about pacing and it taught me so much about just knowing the character already and where this is about to take me. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so much I can say about just Nabokov's style. With it, just For me, when I read it, I was like, oh, I, I can have fun with the English language. Yeah. And I think, you know, being an, uh, an African-American writer, a black female writer, there have been many hurdles throughout my writing life where I'm like, I don't know if I should say a word in this way. I don't know if I should like use a dialect here. And it just, for me, even when I wasn't that serious as a writer as a 17 year old, when I saw that him playing with it as a foreigner, I was like, okay, then like maybe I can do that someday. Like I can, I can, I can bend rules too. So I can it, be experimental. It gave you permission yeah. to some degree. And I wonder, like Lolita obviously wasn't the only novel that gave you that yeah, kind of literary yeah, of permission. But was there like a group, a cohort of novels that did that at the same time? Yeah, I mean, and it's funny because like another novel that I liked, which was kind of, I don't know, you can't even group it, but I loved Madame Bovary. Yeah. I liked Madame Bovary because I was like, man, this is so emotionally charged. And as a teenager, like I was going through just my own stream of emotion. So I was like, okay, so I can talk about a man this way. I can talk about her love feels this way. Um, and so I would put it in that. And then like when I got into grad school myself and then college, I was like, okay, then I'm reading other writers that look like myself, more writers that look like myself. And trying to find that sort of overlap between <laughs> Eastern European writers and then writers of the diaspora at the same yeah. time. And so what are your sort of, Thoughts, if you have any, on this idea of like Nabokov seducing the reader, manipulating the reader through that narration. Oh my God, I have so many thoughts. About <laughs> it. I don't even know, like, should we even should we even go there yet? Yeah, um, why not? Yeah, We're yeah. here. I mean, I just wanted to add, though, you know, when you yeah. or you, one of you just said about g giving permission, I had exactly the same feeling when I first read. Um, I don't even know what of his work I first read, but that that was my primary mm -hmm. reaction to him was how much fun he was having. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the other really important author who did that for me was Donald Barthelme, who was another white man having wonder, a really good was, time with language. Was Barthelme like, in, influenced by Nabokov at all, or was it more? Mm, oh, it seems it seems it seems impossible that he wasn't, mm -hmm. given given when he started and, yeah. and given sort of where he started. But um, I think that 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 sense of having permission to do fun things with language, to be clever and funny. I was really dazzled by that. And it's interesting because when I think of other books that made an impression on me when I was young and that I reread later and saw differently, it's usually an experience of reading for story when I'm young and yeah. then coming back and reading for language and style like Catcher in the Rye or The Great Gatsby. Mm -hmm. And with Nabokov, it was the opposite. Like, my first reaction to him was purely about style. Mm. And I think that I didn't fully, I possibly didn't fully appreciate the story until I just reread it the day before it's yesterday. It's interesting you bring that up because my experience of reading Lolita is similar to Morgan's. I think I was 16 and you were 17. Yeah, six, yeah 17. So 
Yeah, it was a similar thing of, it wasn't on the course syllabus or anything, it's just I was a bored teen who had been reading a lot, I'm Canadian, so we were reading a lot of Canadian literature, and for one module, somehow we were reading One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich by Alexander Solzhenitsyn, <laughs> and I thought, oh, well, I'm already reading emigre Russian literature, and Lolita seems scandalous, and um, I keep hearing about this novel, so I'll pick it up and give it a try. And I just remember feeling like this novel was doing things in literature that I had never mm -hmm. been aware you could do. Mm -hmm. And yet at the same time, I definitely was reading it for story. Like I just, and this is what I, why I, I wanna come back to talking about this idea of seduction and manipulation, because I feel like Lolita is such a great example of using the vehicle of suspense and story to, but also in tandem with language, to really get at deeply disturbing and uncomfortable truths. Yep. Yeah. 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 So, <laughs> or to not get at them. What? Or to not get at them. Well, let's, yeah, let's well, let, let, yeah. say a little bit more about that then. Well, I mean, you know, I don't want to get too granular, but I rereading the book, I got like super, um, I got super obsessed on the sentence level with what was happening because, you know, I don't remember the first time I read the book, but I do remember my. I guess my overall impressions, mm -hmm. and I was trying, before I started it again, I was trying to really take a giant step backwards and think like, what is your sort of experiential attitude toward Lolita? Um, because I have a very intellectual attitude toward it that has to do with the fact that Dolores is 12 mm -hmm. and Humbert is not, her mother dies, he, she's she's a captive, you know. She's abducted by him, and she's utterly without power. But what my experience of the book was really different from that intellectual understanding of the situation. It was an experience of intense dazzlement and romance, and there, there's something so troubling and problematic about that yeah. because I, I think whenever I read the book first, I was still pretty young. It stamped me really, really deeply with this sense of the romance of this inappropriate relationship, mm -hmm. regardless of yeah. how mm -hmm. disturbing the relationship is. And then I saw the movies and was like, well, it's not just me, right? No. Because the, the movies are, are, well, anyway, I've said it. <laughs> no, now. it's fine. Uh, um, yeah. I'm curious as to what your sense is of, you Yeah. Know. No, I agree with Susan. I think, oh, I'm about telling myself, but, um, yeah, when I was growing up, like I I loved writing letters to guys that I liked, um, even if I didn't send them. And it was had a like sort of it was imbued with obsession. So when I read, you know, reading, you know, Humbert Humbert's like confessions, to me I was like, man, I wish a guy would talk about me in this way. And then I felt and then I felt bad because I'm like the the huge age difference, but I was like yeah, like I wish someone would like talk about how my name feels on his tongue and stuff like that. And then also like in the environment that I grew up in, when you're a teenager and you attract an older man, that's like a badge of honor. That means that yeah, you're mature really than the rest. Yeah. That means that you transcended the icky teenage boys. And so I didn't engage with Lolita at first on an intellectual level, it was just a matter of enthrallment that someone, that a man was being this open about his attraction to a child. And then also I think because I was in a state of mind as a teenager where I wanted to attract older men, that I, that I, I knew, it's weird when you read things in the distance, like in the distance, you know, like this is bad but the way that it arrests you, you're like, I can't stop reading. I'm invested in this person. I feel bad for him in certain parts because he does seem like he's craving some deep attraction here. Well, just the fact that you start out with his recounting of the pivotal scene with Annabelle Lee, mm -hmm. and yet even with that, even though there's a, there appears to be this emotional underpinning to it, it's also just straight out of Edgar Allan Poe to the point of the name, mm -hmm. Annabelle Lee. Mm -hmm. So I feel like, Every time I come back to Lolita, it is that conflict between being carried away by the narrative mm -hmm. and by Humbert Humbert's extremely unreliable narration mm -hmm. and the way that the reader or many readers kind of feel as if it is mm -hmm. a love story when in fact it is anything but. Yeah. 
Right. So I, I guess I kind of just want to hear more in terms of your recent rereadings, in terms of, you know, did some, sometimes I would talk to people who had a similar thing to you, Morgan, where you read it at first and got into it, and then later rereading, it was almost like being maybe not slapped in the face, but just it's like the veil mm -hmm. was taken away. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like something similar happened with you, Susan, or? Yeah, I mean, I would say the veil was taken away, but also it keeps coming back. Like the, the veil is like lifted and dropped. And I, I, I was astounded by kind of the, um, the skill with which Nabokov, like marshals all of his forces to retain our empathy and sympathy for Humbert Humbert. Yeah. Like we, it's very, very hard to withdraw your sympathy from him. And at the same time, there's this really sophisticated, like I think he uses the word diabolical to describe Lolita, but the author is really diabolical because he has this like incredibly cunning way, as I was thinking about it today, of kind of inoculating the book against the charge that it's trying to cover over what's happening because they're very explicit um, acknowledgments of the fact that Dolores is a child being repeatedly raped yep. mm -hmm. and physically abused by a much older man mm -hmm. who has abducted her. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, because of his astounding use of language, there are all these moments at which that realization the book of is like, I'm admitting it, but it's somehow subverted into this re-romanticization mm -hmm. of yeah. Humbert. Like mm -hmm. I was, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, even, Spoiler alert, this is like from the very last page. Can we really do a spoiler alert for yeah. a 64 year old novel? But sure. He feels bad at the end. <laughs> but, but at the, oh, he does feel, he ever? He feels bad about it. But at the end, there's this, there's this gorgeous moment where he, Humbert, is thinking about Lolita and he says, and I see I have written yeah. it down, but I don't have my notes. He says, like, within her there was a garden and a temple. Or he mm -hmm. thinks about the fact that within this child there was this world of beauty that he never knew, plus defiled and ruined. But the effect of that moment for me, when I really analyzed it, was admiration for his, the lyricism of yeah. his regret. So it's this weird subversion where the book says, oh, we feel bad about what he did for Lolita, but in the end you go, oh, Humbert, how beautifully you feel bad about it. Mm -hmm, Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And he which, ends up getting our sympathy again. Yep. But I think also with the brilliance of that ending scene, which is when Humbert Humbert has essentially been in some kind of wilderness and he finally finds Dolores where she is now Mrs. Dorothy F. Schiller and she's married to Dick Schiller mm -hmm. and pregnant and, you know, she's forged her own life. So the way I always saw it, and I think it's backed up by the research that I was able to do in the book as archives reading through his wife Vera's diary entries, is that that was supposed to be a triumphant scene for her, even though sh she will end up in tragic circumstances. And so this also brings another bit of sleight of hand where- Triumphant. Because she's forged her own life. She has managed to break away and is living sort of a life that she chose. Oh. You don't see it that way. No. Interesting. I don't see it that way at all. So, so uh, I'm curious, uh, uh, I know, I'm curious uh, uh, as to why. Uh, 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 I mean, that, that, that moment at which Humbert Humbert finds Lo, she's 17 years old. She's like barefoot and pregnant. Mm -hmm. She's di flat broke. I thought it was sad. <laughs> she's, was she's like, but we're only getting it through his perspective. That's what I'm saying. That's yeah. the thing. Yeah. But he but we sees know, it as, as. But we know from her that do she. We? Well, we don't. So that, that's the problem. Yeah. That we, we don't really know of anything. Right. But but at least if you're if you're just gonna adjust and say like, well, everything is through the Humbert lens. I still thought it was incredible. I mean, she's like a victim of sex trafficking yeah. in that scene. I was like, this is a child who's been trafficked by two separate older men. And the only way that she's been able to survive, of course, is to, is to marry mm -hmm. yeah. the first guy who comes along who's like half decent to her. And it's nice that he's half decent, but like on the, on the whole, that's sad. For comparison, yeah. like. Right? That's very yeah. sad. I mean, she should have been graduating high school. Right. Mm -hmm. And instead, she's about to die giving birth. Mm -hmm. Although she doesn't know that yet at that particular point. Mm -hmm. No, we so, know. W but that's the thing. Yeah. We know because Nabokov put it right in the beginning mm -hmm. with the whole confessions of a white widowed male, mm -hmm. this idea of like a fake case study where, you know, we're getting Humbert's memoirs from prison. And so that's actually the something that I, when I re most recently reread it, I keep forgetting that that was the beginning and not 
Humbert's you know, opening soliloquy of light of my life, fire of my loins, because that is so indelible, and yet really the actual beginning is from this psychologist, John Ray Jr. Mm -hmm. So again, it's like all the slate of hand and all this you know, literary manipulation that is going on. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I kind of wanted to get into just from a stylistic standpoint, because basically my book would not exist if not for the parentheticals. So I just wondered what your response were to Nabokov's parentheticals, too. Oh, man. Yeah, I, I, it's hard because even when I read other works of art or just other literary works and I see parentheticals, I just read as if like that's necessary to have that in there. So when he has like these descriptions or he has like these like these emotional reporting moments and he has like these parentheticals there, I'm like, I just read it all continuously. I never question like when I'm reading it like, oh, so why did he do this here? I'm like, it, it all counts because he's an unreliable, even though he's an unreliable narrator, he's all I have. Yep. So I really yeah. can't, you know, it's just like, <laughs> I can't, I can't really distinguish whether or not it's supposed to be there. Or I can keep moving, continue on if I take it out. So I just had, I feel like I had no choice. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I invariably found the parentheticals funny. Often the parenthetical remarks are, um, he's greeting somebody that mm -hmm. he's, he's arrived at this point in this story where he's like, you know, and then I was with this woman, Rita. Hey, Rita. I'm sorry. I hope it, I hope you're. I don't know where you are, but I hope it's good. Anyway, and then he'll continue, and yeah. and so they're humorous and endearing, mm -hmm. as is so much of the narrative. So mm -hmm. much of it endears you to Humber Humber mm -hmm. again right. in this way that's very manipulative. Mm -hmm. But I mean, all of that is true, and that also buttresses a point which I feel like I keep making, which is that you have the narrative outside of the parentheticals, which is what Humber Humber wants the reader to buy into. Yeah. But inside the parentheticals or what he's thinking or what he, it's almost like he's compelled to share that info. So picnic lightning, yeah. just tossed off like that and yet it tells us so much about how he thinks of the death of his mother. Or much later on when he is back at Ramsdale and he's sort of you know, visiting the cemetery and seeing old neighbors and thinking the line about had I done to Dolores, to Dolly, what Frank LaSalle a 50-year-old mechanic had done to 11-year-old Sally Horner in 1948. So this is what I mean. It's like, if that, if that parenthetical had not existed, I would not be up here yeah. talking about yeah. this novel mm -hmm. with, all, with, yeah. with, you, with you all. Yeah, oh, that's interesting because when he thinks that parenthetical thought, he's actually attributing it to these women in the cemetery, yeah. isn't he? Where he sees this woman and he imagines them thinking, hmm, is he one of those dirty old men? Right. So it's not even, it's not even a a moment of reflection that he has directly about No, it's himself. like he's project, it's not yeah. reflection, it's projection. Yeah. yeah. So let me switch gears a little bit to just, you had brought something up earlier about watching the both film adaptations of Lolita in, the in same a day. single day, which yeah. I think is in, incredible and, and <laughs> I have not done that. It <laughs> um, was weird, <laughs> it's a really weird experience. It was yesterday, that's what I did uh, yesterday. <laughs> it was that, okay, so it was that recent. But one of the things about adaptations of Lolita and just the fact that the novel has had such a bizarre cultural afterlife and to my mind has just been misunderstood pretty much since publication. And so I wondered what both of your sense was in terms of how Lolita the novel is thought of in culture and how it's been adapted and how it's been maladapted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's interesting because like after I read it when I was in high school, I kind of kept it buried inside of me until college and when I started studying Russian literature because I didn't know anybody that, one, I wasn't in an environment where a lot of people were reading Russian literature and also two, it was like because the content was so salacious that I was like, ah, I think I should just keep this to myself. But if someone asked me, then I'll open up about it. Um, I've been really angry about the cultural afterlife of Lolita. I get real, I have like a short fuse when people say, well, this book should get canceled or this, sh this book, we shouldn't read this book. Why shouldn't we read this book? Because it makes us uncomfortable, especially because it's inspired from true events. I just feel like it's hard because I think that because we're living in the Me Too era, that now I feel like if I watch anything, 
or if I read anything, if I'm watching Lolita, if I'm watching American Pie, I have that lens now. I'm like, oh, this is fucked up. You know what I mean? Like, this is really fucked up. But if I get up on stage and I talk about how beautiful the language is and, you know, how I learned about, you know, how to use parentheticals or I learned how to really get into the interiorities of a character. Am I letting the boat off easy? You know, if he were alive today, we should cancel him because he decided to write about a, a man's obsession with a young girl, even though that's been happening since time immemorial. You know, so I think that that's my issue is that when we have these conversations, particularly on the Internet, which is, you know, the gre- the best place to have these. Yeah, conversations. yeah, particularly on the Internet. I just think to myself, I feel like it's a lot of people trying to virtue signal a lot. Like, do you really think that we should cancel this book because of the error that we and in fact, we should be reading it. The reason why I feel like we should be reading it is because mm-hmm. now if I engage with the lead on an intellectual level, I'm like, OK. I think Humbert Humbert is charming. How many times do we hear stories about men who are abusers in their communities, women that date them, women that work with them, and they say, well, he was charming. Well, he would never do that. You know what I mean? So when we talk about seduction in the story, we're getting hooked into it. You know, and and does that make us just as culpable? I think we should be having these discussions. And I don't know if that was Nabokov's intent at all, but it's like, if I can do that with an imaginary character, what does that say about real life when we hear these stories? We see it echo all the time. Yeah, absolutely, I totally agree. And I mean, the idea of cancellation is just, it's, well, it's, it's infantile because like, let's just bury our heads in the sand and I think what we should be doing is reading it smart. Yes. The, way, the way we're talking about it now, and that's why I was so happy to reread it in a way, because you know I want to go back to what you said about a badge of honor, right? Mm-hmm. Because yeah. the thing that was so powerful to me about rereading Lolita was realizing how how much it partakes of how much it it partook in its time of utterly utterly specious patriarchy and sexism and how much it has reinforced those structures Mm -hmm. as this enormous cultural Mm -hmm. event and as this masterpiece. And so let's try to understand that because my reaction to it originally was to respond to the romance. And I know that I've internalized that idea not just because of books like Lolita, but because of the structure of sexism in our lives. You know, when I was a 14, 15, 16 year old girl, yes, also. Right. It was an utter, absolute badge of honor to attract the attention of an older man. And like, let's look at why is, and right. I'm sure it's still true. Right, actually, and, and, and that's the thing, it's, it's like, definitely still true. I'm just worried about our, our grace and empathy as readers and critical thinkers if we decide to stifle books like this because of what we think will happen. We think that, that we'll perpetuate more abusers if we, if we continue to read things like this. And even like just being on stage and saying like, oh, I thought this was a badge of honor. I almost felt afraid to say that because of the time period that we're in now, that if we sit with this discomfort, you know, with with something that um, that we engage with, that we like, or it just holds our attention and it's not politically correct of the time, then something is grotesquely wrong with us mm-hmm. rather than the book being some type of mirror of the society in which we live. I mean, I wrote this book not to castigate Lolita because I can't. I mean, even having come through the other side of writing and publishing it, I'll still say Lolita is one of the greatest novels of the 20th century. And I will stand by that pretty much till the end because of what it does, because of the kinds of discussions that it engenders. And so when I've been asked this sort of cancellation question, and there have even been publishers Mm-hmm. Contemporary publishers were like, well, if that manuscript came across my desk now, I wouldn't oh, publish of course, it. Though. But it, to me, it's like we're at, that's the wrong question. Right. Because I see Lolita, and I don't, and I'm curious if either of you agree, or both of you agree here. But I see it as such a product of post World War II America, and it's so chronicling that 1947 mm-hmm. to 52 mm-hmm. time frame yeah. that I can't divorce it from that. It's like it's talking about an America that not only doesn't entirely exist, it's almost, it's the America that current, pe- you know, certain people in power are allegedly nostalgic for. And so <laughs> thinking about it on those terms and realizing, well, what exactly are we being nostalgic for? Mm-hmm. Are, we, are we actually nostalgic for an incredibly nightmarish vision of what America was or should be or, or could be? 
instead of actually grappling with what had happened. So, yeah. But I actually have a question for you, though. Yeah. Like, when you say, okay, Lolita is one of the greatest novels of the 20th century, have you ever had someone question your moral compass because of you saying that, whether oh, yeah. they said it explicitly or implicitly? Yeah, I remember giving a talk, I think it was at Kenyon College, and one very smart grad student kind of castigated me for this idea. And so when I gave the answer about you know, thinking about it from a historical context and also thinking about it in terms of Nabokov's own history as a multiple displaced emigre to America and, and sort of finding some degree of rootedness in this country and feeling a real sense of patriotism by finally landing, mm -hmm. then I feel like she didn't quite get it, but she had more to think about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so one of the and so that's why I just keep coming back that a novel that makes you think like Lolita does, and the fact that we're still arguing about it all these decades later, I mean, what incredible power mm -hmm. to right. have. Right. Right. And 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 yeah, what incredible power it has. And also it it shows us things that we don't necessarily want to see. Right. right. Um, like your comment about how it's afterlife, right? So I, I did watch the two films, and what was striking to me was that each of the two films, so there's the um, Stan, Stanley Kubrick version, which Nabokov actually wrote the screenplay, and then there's this subsequent Adrian Lyne version from 1997 for which Stephen Schiff did the screenplay, and the films are incredibly different um, considering that they share source material. Um, tonally, they're so incredibly different, but I think mm -hmm. It's interesting that the, the two films in their total divergence, to me, you, you know, you said misunderstood, but I'm, I'm, I'm kind of gonna push back on that because yeah. I actually think one of the things about Lolita that's so problematic is that it's much easier to misunderstand it than to understand it, right? It's much, much easier to read it and laugh mm. than it is to read it and recoil in horror. Yeah. It's much easier to read it and be seduced than it is to um, recognize what actually happens to Dolores. And I think that's no accident. No, it definitely It's no is accident not. at all. And so that's, I think, something that forces us to, to look at ourselves and think like, well, what, it is, what is it that I'm reacting to mm -hmm. that's making it so easy for me to read past explicit mentions of physical battery, mm -hmm. of rape, mm -hmm. of captivity, and uh, you know, come away with like romantic, landscapes and um, the Kubrick film is I would say best described as a work of black humor mm. it's very funny and the line film is I think best described as like a melancholy gorgeous ravishing romance and so both of those ways in which the book ends up coming across I think are important to look at because yeah. it's like how are we able to laugh at this story and how are we able to be seduced by this story mm -hmm. I mean part of an answer and this is why I find the Kubrick film so, in some degrees, infuriating and in some degrees just deeply troublesome because of the reaction of laughter and also the fact that the main, in a way, the main character of that novel is Claire Quilty. I'm not, the adaptation of the novel is, is uh, Peter Sellers playing Claire Quilty. But both Kubrick and his producing partner, James Harris, have both been quoted as saying that they couldn't figure out how to adapt Lolita as a film until they realized in their minds that it was a quote, twisted love story. Mm. And just, it's this idea of like, how do you see it as a twisted love story? But in reading yeah. a lot of the critical response at the time, there were so many critics who saw it as a, essentially that, I mean, I still, I'm sort of mad at Robertson Davies, who otherwise is a great Canadian writer for writing this review of Lolita where he basically said, this isn't a, no I'm paraphrasing here, this isn't a novel about um, a child corrupted by a man, but a man corrupted by a child. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it's just, how, yeah, how do, you, how do you have such responses? Well, I but, would say you have such responses because Nabokov makes you have them. Right. I mean, the book is full of, of uh, it's full of these, and when I say brilliant, I'm not condoning them morally. I'm saying that they're brilliant because they're devastatingly effective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Brilliant literary strategies by which he presents a story that you should respond to in one way, and it gives you a, the completely opposite mm -hmm. impression. I mean, Dolores is, 
both given all this agency, right? Reader, it was she who seduced me. And yep. at the same time, she's like made into this kind of like dopey child. Like at one point they're having intercourse mm -hmm. and Humbert describes her as she's reading the paper with the expression on her face of somebody who sat on a tennis racket and is like kind of too, yeah. just can't be bothered to move. Yeah. So Ugh. it's like Lolita is figured as both agent in this sexual interaction and as, as kind of oblivious to it or mm -hmm. unaffected by it, which is like a wish fulfillment, right? Which makes it's like a, a child with sexual agency who isn't bothered. Which makes me it now wonder if my own interpretation of Humbert in a way lets him off the hook because I just view him as this wholly unreliable narrator and that nothing he says is approximates the truth at all. So even this idea of Lolita as the one who instigates the the sexual sexual intercourse, I'm not going to call it a relationship here, the fact that she is the quote instigator, it's like, why should I believe him? But in saying, why should I believe him, does that take away from my own complicitness as a reader because I'm just like, oh, you're he's just automatically a villain as opposed to there's something much more troubling and disturbing going on from a narrative standpoint. So I wondered just what your thoughts were on that, Morgan. On which part? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, just this idea of how we, how, how we can interpret Humbert's narration, but also to some degree, you know. So. Yeah, so I think I did let him off the hook. And I'm thinking back to the part where he's like, oh, she seduced me. To me, again, like growing up, it's like if, if a man was hitting on you, it was your fault. You know, you, you have your cleavage out. You were talking too, lo talking too long to him. Your skirt is too high. Like it's never the man's fault. So when he mm -hmm. was saying it was, so as I was reading it first as a teenager and I was reading those lines, I was just like, nah, I've heard this before many a times. There was no, there was no type of alarm there. Um, in fact, it almost hit too close to home, speaking personally. Um, in terms of just like his narration, I didn't actually watch any of the movies. And the reason why I, cho I actually purposely chose not to watch it, oh, because if I saw it, like people actually playing it out, rather than it just being in my head, it would make it all too real. And then I'd be even feel even more guilty that I like the book. At least when I'm reading it, my mind can go all different types of places. It still feels a little bit more amorphous to me but once i see it on the screen i'm just like oh god i feel terrible i feel terrible i mean i have to admit one of the weirdest experiences that i had this year was seeing a staged reading of a musical adaptation of lolita which i've written about it's called lolita my love and ah. it, it's the people involved in it are i mean they should have known better frankly it was alan j lerner who did my fair lady and Camelot doing the lyrics in the book. It was wow. John Barry who did the James Bond theme doing what? music. What? Wow. Um, it had Denise Nickerson, who recently died, who was like Violet Beauregard in the um, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, I mean, it had a really good cast. It had a surprisingly good score. And I read multiple versions of the book. It's a mess. And so watching this, the staging and seeing these representations, you know, this physical manifestation of, of everybody, but especially of Dolores Hayes, it, yeah, you can't get past it. Mm -hmm. And I think that ultimately, I've yet to see a proper adaptation of Lolita. And something I was curious if either of you were paying attention to is also some recent novels which tried to present Dolores Hayes's perspective from her own perspective. So if you're oh. like a couple of decades ago, there was Lowe's Diary, Lowe's Diary yeah. by Pia Perra. And now there's this new one called Journal de L by Christophe Tison. Oh. And so I want like, do you, I mean, obviously without having read them, it's hard to make judgments on them, but I mean, is this just a failed idea or, or can this be successful? I think it could be successful. I think, you know, when you're talking about unreliable narration, I think of why can't I hear it from her side, yeah. you know, and what it, and especially if it's a revisiting of all of the scenes that he lays out with them together, I, I'd be totally into reading it. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, obviously one of the things about Lolita that <laughs> makes it the book that it is is that we never see anything from Lolita's perspective, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Everything mm -hmm. is from Humbert's perspective, and so um, her 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 subjectivity mm -hmm. is is 
is doesn't exist in the book. And uh, I don't know. I think it would be really, really interesting. I haven't read either of those books, but um, I've been thinking about this in terms of the John Fowles book, The Collector, yeah. which I don't know if people are familiar with it, but The Collector is a is a novel about um, a sexually obsessed man who takes the object of his obsession captive. Um, he abducts her, and he, and he uh, locks her in his basement. And um, it's interesting to me because that book has been castigated for misogyny, and yet I find that book, and I love Lolita, but mm -hmm. Lolita I think is a deeply misogynistic book. I think that it's like, it's just, the misogyny is baked into every part of it, and the reason that I think it's so important is because Nabokov makes it so gorgeous mm -hmm. and irresistible. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think we should feel guilt for being seduced by it. I think yeah. we should feel an interest in why it speaks mm -hmm. to us. Like, yeah. how is this managing to speak to me? Um, the Collector is interesting because it's accused of misogyny, and yet there's an entire section in it, sorry, spoiler alert, mm -hmm. that's from <laughs> the woman's point of view. And it's an utterly different reading experience because when you leave the point of view of her obsessed captor and suddenly are seeing She's everything yeah. from her perspective, it's it's an amazing embracing shock and she becomes utterly real mm -hmm. in a way that Lolita never mm -hmm. becomes real. Mm -hmm. Lolita is always this, you know, this. She's always subsumed by the narrative that Humbert presents. Yeah, and, and, and she's and, always a figure of fantasy, yeah. you know. Um, even at the moments at which he's most uh, acknowledging of what he's doing, he's he's still fantasizing her. Yeah, but you know, in just the way that you're talking about Lolita, and the way we've been talking about Nabokov and language, that's why I sort of made this connection between Nab Nabokov and trust exercise, and I think it just has to do with how you were playing with narration and style. So that's why. I was curious if that is indeed a connection that you even thought of or if it was even at the subconscious level. I mean, I think I've been thinking about him ever since <laughs> ever since I started writing. Yeah. And I'm always thinking about him on a sentence level. I'm always trying to figure out how he makes sentences and, mm -hmm. and I'm always trying to steal mm -hmm. his methods. Yeah. Um, and I think trust exercise is influenced by Lolita in the way that like much of what I've written has been influenced by it. Yeah. But in some deep way, I didn't sit down and think, mm -hmm. and now mm -hmm. yeah. I will explore the influence of Lolita <laughs> but, again. But that's not a didactic way of thinking about it. I mean, I know that there are homages, and people do sit down and go, I want to emulate this book. But I also feel like Nabokov himself had this compulsion that he was working through that I feel like to engage with Lolita, it almost has to come from a sense of compulsion now, too. One last question for you, Morgan, before mm -hmm. turning it over to the audience. But I know that unlike Susan and me on stage and perhaps the rest of you, you've actually been to St. Petersburg and visited the Nabokov Museum. And I wanted to hear so much more about this. Yeah, so, uh, so I studied Russian literature in college, uh, comparative literature. So I was, part of it was I, I was doing Russian literature. And it was interesting because when I went there, we had like a tour guide and we went through like his, his home and his butterfly collection. And it was interesting because Lolita was like just one of many parts of his life that was magnified for me. I was just told about his brilliant mind and all of his diverse interests. We watched like a clip of him talking when he talked, I was like, oh, he's exactly what I dreamed that he would be. <laughs> just based off what the, because he was talking all fast and his mind was just moving and the interview was not keeping up at certain parts. <laughs> very, very eccentric in a way that I thought like Humbert Humber was eccentric, like with the parenthetical, like, hey, wait, it's like, that's when he, he just kept moving. But it was just, it was a delight. Like it was a thing where we were talking about Lolita. There wasn't so much emphasis on you know, how taboo it was. It was like, this was just a part of his work. This was a part of his trajectory. They actually did talk about the the back, like just how much editors like pushed him aside and was like, oh, like, I don't know if you want to touch this. But yeah, it was interesting in a way, like being stateside and talking about Lolita, it's like people mainly focus on that book rather than like his whole, old, like his whole, like, you know, all of his works. Um, but when I was there, I was just like, this is an, an incredibly brilliant man that does, not just in the literary field, but like the scientific field. So it just gave me more of an 
overview of who he was as a person, you know? Mm -hmm. And then what, I guess, if you had to pick what other Nabokov book which one sort of speaks to you the most? Pale Fire. I was about to say that. I was See, about to I say that. I would speak memory because it's such a beautiful. I mean, they're all good. But... They're all good, but Pale Fire is. Pale Fire is pretty amazing. It's yeah. Really that one. Yeah. So I would love to open it up for a few questions, and I believe there's a mic going around. So yeah. please speak into it, because otherwise I'll have to repeat the question back. Yeah. Any questions? Over there. Hi, I'm curious if uh, if you're aware of anything in uh, Nabokov's relationship with his wife Viera, that kind of that some of the impetus for this book might come from that, um, because there are some people who think that actually she wrote quite a bit, maybe not out of, for this book, but she's like the good wife. There's a movie that came out I think last year if yeah. you guys know, about this writer who's actually writing, but her husband takes credit for everything and gets a Nobel Prize in the end. So there are some people who think that something like that was happening in um, Nabokov's life, and that perhaps this was, um, Viera is in a way Lolita in some ways, that, you know, some, not an exact uh, comparison, but he has a certain power over her, and she's kind of like a child unable to, Mm. Get away from it. I never heard that theory. Now I gotta go research. Now I have something to research. I <laughs> heard the variants of it, but I guess just from having gone through Nabokov's archives, which are at the New York Public Library and to some degree the Library of Congress, and also reading Stacey Ship's amazing biography, the relationship between Vera and Vladimir was exceedingly complicated. And sometimes when I get flippant, I like to think of Vera as his brand manager because she was basically responsible for kind of cultivating this image of him as this great artist. Um, she would take over the correspondence, sometimes actually sign letters as his name or as Mrs. Vladimir Nabokov. She looked after the money, she looked after the houses, she would teach when he couldn't. But, and of course, somewhat infamously, there were m moments when he was writing Lolita where he wanted to sort of chuck the manuscript in the fire, mm. and she would just happen to be around to make sure that it was safe. I feel like this is a little bit performative, because just the idea that he was ready to burn the manuscript mm. when she was around <laughs> just feels a little, <laughs> it, it just doesn't feel terribly spontaneous here. Um, so without Vera, he would not have been able to write. But of course, their relationship was also complicated because he had a mistress, there were students, so they kind of had to figure all of that out. And yet I also come back to, she kept a diary in the run-up to the American publication of Lolita, which was fascinating for me because it really chronicled that they, they knew that it was going to be some kind of phenomenon. They didn't know to what degree. And there was one thing that she wrote once the critical reception was coming in and mostly these male writers were, you know, siding with Humbert and sort of diminishing Dolores. And again, I'm going to paraphrase, but she wrote this thing, this little note about uh, how terrible it is that all these people have misunderstood poor Dolores and she's the real heroine of the story. Mm -hmm. And she wished that more people could see it that way. So ultimately what I would say is Vera is an incredibly complex, fascinating figure in her own right. She had a lot of reasons to kind of edit the narrative so that she was out of it and that it was all always about him, but it was a much more complicated story. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi. Um, you know how recently there have been so many horror movies coming out that have like very subtle elements of horror on the screen? What do you think about Lolita being classified as like in the horror genre in that way. Do you mean Lolita the book or Lolita, yeah, Lolita the, the book. movies? As horror? Mm. You mean like as if like Shirley Jackson wrote it? Because that would be an interesting thing yeah, to contemplate. Yeah. I mean, it's, it is, it's, 
I think it's a book that's horrifying. Yeah. <laughs> but it doesn't, it certainly doesn't feel like horror to me. I think that's what's horrifying about it, actually. Yeah. Is that, mm-hmm. is that it's a horrifying story that feels like a, feels like a romance. And then what does that say about you? Yeah. One other, <laughs> one other way I'd answer it is that I often thought of it from a crime fiction standpoint, and I don't think that's also an accident because there is this tremendous amount of suspense that is being generated. There's, I mean, they also go on a road trip, and there's this idea of what's going to happen next. Mm-hmm. And Nabokov was a very studious reader of crime fiction, although, again, he would try to diminish the genre and and demean it in some degrees. Mm-hmm. But this was another thing he did where he would do this whole thing where he would t- essentially talk shit about writers but also teach them. And mm. it's like, really, you're, you're saying all these bad things about Dostoevsky, but you teach him at Cornell every year. So clearly, why would you engage with books you hate mm-hmm. on that level? That just mm-hmm. feels to me like a waste of time. But mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, obviously, I only have some small degree of insight into Nabokov's brain, and um, I can't speak for why he would do that, but it just seems to me is very strange. But clearly, he read the genre. Even, like, there are even like, little references, not just to Edgar Allan Poe, but there's an Agatha Christie novel that gets sort of a weird shout out. He read other random locked room mysteries. He would write letters to his frenemy, uh, the critic Edmund Wilson, mm. talking about uh, novels, um, in part because Edmund Wilson had written these pieces for The New Yorker, dissing the genre, and people got upset. And Nabokov privately wrote him, was like, hey, love these pieces. Also, have you read this uh, Sherlock Holmes pastiche? So there's a lot going on where underneath the public face, um, it's, it's again, m- a much more complicated picture. But I think reading Lolita as a crime novel is not necessarily a wrong reading. And now I'm just more interested to think about it as a, from a horror context, too. Mm-hmm. We have time for two more questions. Mm-hmm. There's one over there. Um, not to reference Netflix during a literary event, but um, That's okay. Hannah Gadsby's Nanette a mm-hmm. while ago um, basically imply that artists like Picasso should be, quote, canceled for their like, egregious behavior towards young women. Um, and I guess my question is, at what point should whatever gender of author be canceled for their actions, not necessarily Nabokov? You might have been asked this before, sorry. Oh, no, 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 it's fine. I actually just want to know what, what either of you think oh, before I take, I feel like I'm talking yeah, so much. Yeah, because I love Nanette. And when, so for her was another thing that I think she does so brilliantly well. In the beginning, it's all funny, funny, ah, and then all of a sudden, like 35 minutes in, it's like, I'm not laughing at all. When she says that um, Picasso should be canceled because of all these sort of things he did, I don't agree with that, again, because I'm like, I want to know about men. I really do. I want to study them. And so, But the problem is, is that where I got, where the interpretation I got from what she was talking about is that we, we let brilliant men off the hook for their brilliance. In fact, I think one time I even tweeted, like, when I hear that a man is a genius, I think, what did, who did he abuse? Because usually that word, that saying someone's a genius, some man's a brilliant, it's like, what, who are the people that he may have mistreated along the way? Um, I think it's hard because when you're talking about, like, let's say we look at it from a comedic standpoint. Yeah. If we look at people like Dave Chappelle, if we look at people like Louis C.K., where they made these jokes, there are certain, there's a certain legion of fans who'll be like, well, he's just embodying a character. He's just like saying these things to ruffle your feathers. Like, but what if that's who that person really is? The hard thing with it is with authors is like, when I'm reading Lolita, like I never thought, oh, uh, Nabokov is, is, a, is a pedophile. I never thought that in my life. Um, I don't know. I don't have a real answer for that. Cause I'm like, yeah, I do think that artists should be, that artists should get canceled at the same time they don't really get canceled. I am like, I'm a, I'm a very much a stereotypical millennial. I'm always on the internet and it is an echo chamber. And we say people get canceled, but then they come right back within a year or two. So they don't lose any money. You know, they might get shamed for a little while. So it's like, what really there, I don't really believe there's such a thing as cancel culture. The people that we cancel, they come back anyway. So, but when we're talking about the, like 
like canonical works from the past, we can't that, that we can't do that. Like, I just don't feel like we can cancel people who are dead and people who, whose people whose work stand, have, stand, have stood the test of time. I think we can contextualize them in the, in the, you know, the climate that we're in, but we also need to properly contextualize them in the time that they were written to. I think that's so important, and I think that's often missing from the equation. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> and the only thing I'll add to that is, with respect to Picasso in particular, I would highly recommend reading François Guillot's uh, Life with Picasso, which New York Review of Books Classics just reissued. Mm. It is a unbelievably brilliant accounting of her relationship with Picasso. She doesn't let him off the hook at all. She really describes how cruel he was to her and to others, exactly in service of his genius. But there's also such a degree of love and. I would argue a bit of mercy in how she portrays him, which ultimately became ironic because when it was published in the early 60s, he sued her and people were trying to get it banned. Mm. But reading it now, it's like, this seems to me the most true portrayal of what it is to live with a deeply, deeply flawed genius who is clearly, his art clearly stands the test of time, but you just have to sort of look at the totality of him as a person. And mm -hmm. I guess the only thing, I've said this before, but the thing about being canceled is you can always come back in reruns. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. I wanna say one other thing, which is that, I mean, and I loved, I loved Nanette, actually, and I thought it was incredibly powerful. Um, but I don't really understand what cancel culture even means because it seems, you, know, you said virtue signaling earlier. And you know, what are we even talking about? Cancellation is the easy way out culturally. It's the way for all of us to say like, you're done, I, we're all okay now, I feel better. And all of these, all of these people are, represent underlying structures right. that are still there, right? right? And mm -hmm. so if you go around just like canceling some egregious examples of sexism and then you think like, whew, right. all right, we, we did a great thing for women today. You know, all of those underlying structures that that value men's work more than women's work, that uh, enable us all to sort of mistake a romance between a much older man and a much younger helpless girl as being romantic in some way. Like all those structures still exist. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They still exist and they're being enacted like all around us right now. So if we go around and like cancel a few conspicuous symbols of those ideas, I think that that's really dangerous. It is then dangerous. We, then we all feel like we've done it. You know, and actually the work is much harder than that. So it is. Yeah. And I think we have to be okay with being uncomfortable sometimes. I'm not gonna say to re traumatize yourself. I, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is like I think it's often hard, even writers who are just writing essays online, they're so worried about being canceled. And I think that's the hard thing, is like writers need to have space to work through their ideas. They don't exist in a vacuum. And if they learn if they're trying to honestly interrogate themselves and interrogate the world in which they live why should we humiliate people for that so yeah i feel like when like for example if going back to dave Chappelle, if he's talking about you know making light of of pedophilia and 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 or, or all of that i think yeah he deserves it but at the same time we're talking about nabokov and you have these internet conversations like yeah like we shouldn't read a book like that and it's like but why when we're still seeing older men abuse younger women and get off the hook all the time. Why should we cancel? Because it makes us uncomfortable with the truth? Because that, that's, the, that's the only reason why I can feel that way. You know, or you're upset because you're individually uncomfortable. That doesn't mean that the truth just automatically doesn't exist anymore. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. I think we have time for one more. Hi, um, this is making me wonder about, you mentioned the, the kind of genius who gets off the hook, mm -hmm. right? Or the genius, the brilliant man who mm -hmm. gets off the hook and we let him off the hook. Mm -hmm. And then we have the woman or the abused who writes and who becomes heroic because of her mercy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering as women writers, um, how women can, like how do we get I feel like this is uh, these kind of like archetypes of these people mm -hmm. have been perpetuated and exist in the real world and make us uncomfortable, but are real and we can empathize with both parties. And so how, how I'm just wondering how women can write about 
their abuse, or anyone who's been abused can write about the abuser without mercy and still be heroic. Man, in this, yeah. that's a life. <laughs> that's, mo- that's like, yeah, no, right. no, that's like, a, I would almost argue that like, if I may, like, I think that's like an Odyssean journey. And the reason why I say that is like, I'm just tip, go there. Like if you're a woman who dates men, have any romantic feelings, or, or just like, just a woman in society, like you are conditioned, whether you realize it or not, to lean into the man. And if you have been abused, unfortunately, a lot of times, you know, when, and I had to learn this myself, when I watch movies or like when I watch documentaries, like why did that woman keep going back? It's like, because they've been abused. Like that's an abuser dynamic. They try to isolate you and then, they, and then you realize I don't have any place to go. So when you say, how does a writer create us or, um, embellish a story about their lives where they don't give the abuser any mercy, but they can still seem as hero as seen as heroic. Um, that's I think that's often I think that's tough to do on many different levels because a lot of times when I talk to women writers and they write about their abusers, they want to be likable. They're all before they even put pen to page. They're like, I want to be relatable. I ho- so they're almost like be- they're censoring themselves yes, from the get go. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I it happened. It never happens with my male writers. It, my male students. It never happens. It's always with women. Before they they paralyze themselves before they even really get into what they're talking about. It's like I want to make sure I'm relatable. I'm going to make sure I'm likable. I'm like, don't care. Like, give yourself mercy before you publish something. Because once it's out of your hands, you don't know how people are gonna interpret it. And they don't even give themselves that. And then I realized as an instructor, I'm like, I just can't stay in this world sometimes. Um, because I can teach you technical things. I can tell you my own personal story, but they know the world and we live in that world. And it's like, how do I dismantle that and let you know like it is okay to be like, fuck him. Like, you know what I mean? And, and still go on. And people will be like, well, why don't you be more optimistic? And it's like, no, I'm allowed to be angry, right, you know? Right, and that whole fear of being liked or disliked, that, that fear about being liked, it's like that's how we all participate in yeah. sexist culture yep. as women is that we we continue to worry about whether we're likable. Right, right. You know, which but is like, a very female thing. To take your question, if you got that as a, while teaching fiction, mm-hmm. how would you sort of respond to that student? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, you know, I I guess I would respond most concretely with an example of what I think is an outstanding piece of writing that that looks at a very similar relationship in a really different way. It was a story that I taught for years called Lawns by Mona Simpson. Does anyone know this story? No, tell us. Mona Simpson, but not that story. So this is a really extraordinary story, and and it has so, I've always wanted to ask her if she wrote it after or in reaction to Lolita, because it's a story about a young woman who is being sexually abused by her father. And, um, and it's, it's, a, it's a really powerful and devastating story. And if you read it against Lolita and sort of look at the ways in which this relationship is depicted as opposed to the way in which Lolita's relationship with Humbert is depicted, I think it's, a, it's very instructive in terms of um, a really powerful representation of the experience of sexual abuse that doesn't romanticize um, and that is very unsparing. And the thing that's been so kind of difficult for me and ironic is that I've been hesitant to teach it in recent years because I've gotten complaints from students who are survivors of sexual abuse that they feel that they shouldn't shouldn't be. They don't want to engage with it. They don't want to engage with it. Um, And that's really hard because I actually feel that that story should be, is, is something that should be read specifically because it's, um, it's really unsparing and it's a depiction of something that, that the novel Lolita romanticizes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. yeah. <laughs> I think on that note, just let's call it here. Thank you all thank so you. much for coming, for witnessing this amazing conversation. Yeah. Thank you to Morgan and thank, thank you. you to Susan for joining me tonight. Thank and you. I thank guess you for having us. And yeah. we'll all be signing right outside. So yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you.